Good morning. It's uh, a little after 8 a.m. December the 9th, 9th of uh, 2017. It's quite warm here in Christchurch, New Zealand. So uh, 43 degrees south latitude. Um, early summer. We've had a bit of a warm start to summer as it is. Here's something I just repotted these about uh, two weeks ago. Now this is the carob bean tree, Serotonus liquia something like that, which is native to the Mediterranean and uh, Middle East areas. Uh, these seeds came f down from up north. Uh, there's no adults that I know growing anywhere in this area, although I've read that there's some up Rangiora Way, which is about 30 miles, about 50 kilometres north of here. Uh, they're actually inland a wee bit, and they do cop a bit of frost. Supposedly they can take frost down to about negative 8, as long as it doesn't last too long. Certainly they grow these in Australia, places that get frosts of negative four and five most winters. Um, I had a bunch of seeds which I treated some with hot water and soaking and some just with cold water and soaking. I then actually uh, mixed them up as I planted them but uh, and I ended up with two pots uh, about this big, perhaps not this exact pot, and when I um, uh, these came from autumn about April, May 2015, so two and a half years. This is the very largest, so that's uh, over half a metre tall. So it ended up with five or six in each pot. I ended up with 12 altogether. I've just got three here to show you. Uh, this is the very largest, um, and several a little bit smaller. I've got several about this size. That's about 100 millimetres, or about four inches tall. It's got some nice new growth coming. They did wilt for the first few days after after I um, uh, I had to be very violent, I had to pretty much bare root them um, to, to tease them apart, being five or six in each pot. And as I was knocking the dirt out of the pot and getting them out, minimising as much as I could the great root disturbance that I had to do to them, and, and this, like any plant from a dry climate, they actually say, please don't disturb the roots, you know, they really don't like it, that kind of thing. I actually noticed one seed was just sprouting. It was actually still below the soil level, and as some of the soil came out, it was a visible, visible uh, because it looks like a little pea sprouting, and here it is. So I carefully picked that and put that into a pot of its own, with it um, just barely about to break the surface of the soil. And in the last week and a half, there we go, it's popped up like that, and it's even got some new, as well as the seed leaves, um, it's actually got two new leaves just opened this last few days, so it looks like it's doing all right. I became interested and involved in carob in Australia when I was living there. I got this book, which I would recommend if you can get it. Um, it's more intended for farmers or people on like hobby farms or lifestyle blocks, but it's a great resource for carobs. I mean, I've got a number of gardening books where they get a carob gets a photo and one paragraph. This, although it's a smallish book, it's a whole book just on carobs. It's called Growing Carobs in Australia, and it's by Henry S. Ben Shade and Jeff Wilson, and it's from Goddard and Dobson Publishers at Station Street, 486 Station Street, Box Hill, Victoria, 3128 in Australia. I actually contacted the, um, I got this book straight from the publisher, I actually bought in, uh, and postage was going to be the killer, I bought in over 20 books so I could um, uh, average out the postage and I, I shared them around local members of the permaculture community. So um, uh, they, they were still in pre, in the days when normal people didn't have access to email and internet, they were still available Back then, the publisher still had them, you know, stocks of them. You could buy them direct from the publisher, and they were happy to post them, subject to extra cost for postage. Um, uh, the carob is considered, um, well, it'll go down to about 250 millimetres annual rainfall, about 10 inches, so to the very edge of desert. And as I say, it will, will certainly take frosts. Um, they grow these up in the North Island a bit, and you can buy them at some nurseries as, as you know, seedlings. Something that the book does explain, and it's probably not going to come out on the picture here, um, 
like any dry climate, Mediterranean, arid tolerant plant, to get the absolute best arid tolerance, you need to direct seed it. You need to put the seed in the ground. And in some places like the Middle East and Greece, what, uh, what the traditional villagers and that have done, and farmers have found wild growing seedlings, which may actually not give good pods, because the pods are the main edible part. And um, they will graft little buds on it from known good trees. Um, they almost always male and female on separate trees. So you do need to have several plants to ensure that you've got at least one male and at least one female so that you know that you'll get um, pods. The, uh, the chocolate health food substitute carob is actually made from the outer part of the pod. Um, I mean the pod itself, not the actual seed inside apparently. The seed's very hard, like many things from Mediterranean and arid climates. So most people have a system, they either nick the outer part of the seed with a, a knife or pruning shears, or they splash it with hot water, or they soak it um, for 24 hours to two or three days. Um, the system I've generally used is to get one cup of water out of the kettle, so it's nearly boiling, to put seeds in a kitchen sieve and to trickle the water over them for the amount of one cup's worth and then to drop them in a bowl of cold water so they're getting a bit of a hot cold change, getting a little bit of a trickle and that uh, also works for castor oil and for other things and, and then they get left to soak for 24 hours that are dry climate resistant. So this book does of course go on about that if you want the best drought tolerant you've either got to direct seed them or plant them initially into very deep pots. They're talking about metre deep pots here. Apparently in there, if you put them in a deep pot and uh, even by that stage, that's three centimetres high now, four, three and a half, four centimetres high, just over an inch, that would naturally have had the root um, half a metre deep already. So, obviously these ones, um, they're only planted in normal pots. They're, they're not going to have that original tap root that many of these super drought tolerant plants can, um, can develop right from the seedling stage. So, um, but they're still a very drought tolerant um, plant. They do form a dense shrub or a small tree and uh, should be more grown and certainly in Canterbury, in the, uh, in the Canterbury, so in the east coast and not too far from the coast areas of the South Island and also I'd suggest around similar parts of the North Island, uh, around Gisborne and the eastern part of the North Island which also tends to get hot dry summers. Uh, much of the North Island does, is a high rainfall area so you not really getting the benefit from such a drought tolerant plant but there you go whether you want to use the uh, pods for cattle fodder or, um, or you just want a drought tolerant plant that uh, considered reasonably slow growing compared to other stuff but uh, here we go so hopefully I mean that survived now supposedly damping off is a problem where some seedlings sprout and then die and certainly earlier on I did have even more sprouts and then they died but the fact that two and a half years on, I'm still getting individual seeds sprouting. So yeah, some seeds are obviously only just sprouting two and a half odd years on. Um, I reincorporated the soil from the original two pots with about six seedlings each into the other pots. So it may still come to pass that there were tiny little seeds in there that might sprout even later. But um, the seeds definitely still viable two and a half years on. I think that's all I have to say on carob at the moment.